Okay, you have quorum. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Vancouver City Council meeting of Tuesday, April 13th. Uh, we're meeting under the um, part 14 of the procedure bylaw that is authorized by the Minister of Public State, uh, Safety Order uh, M192. And as such, uh, council members are participating by phone. Um, if my connection is lost uh, during any portion of this meeting, we'll recess until the uh, connection is restored. And uh, same holds for you, council, if the connection is lost any time during the voting process. Uh, video of council members speaking, presentations, and vote results will be projected to viewers uh, when, <clears throat> when available. Uh, of course, we acknowledge we're on the unceded territories of the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh people and thank them for their generosity to all who live uh, on these lands. And um, also want to thank staff for all their fantastic work uh, through COVID-19 and beyond. Really looking forward to getting through this and uh, we can all be seeing each other in the hallways. That would be great. Uh, Clerk, can I have the uh, roll call, please? Mayor Stewart in the chair. Councillor Carr? Here. Councillor DiGenova is on a medical leave this morning. Councillor Fry? Here. Councillor Swanson? Here. Councillor Hardwick? Present. Councillor Weeb? Present. Councillor Boyle? Present. Councillor Dominato? Here. Councillor Bly? Present. Councillor Kirby Young. Not present. You have quorum, Mayor Stewart. Thank you very much. Uh, Council, we're going to start off on a bit of a somber note with a condolence message about the uh, Duke of Edinburgh. So I'll read this out and uh, hope we can have a moment of silence at the end of the uh, statement. On behalf of Van Vancouver City Council, I'd like to extend my sincere condolences to Her Majesty the Queen and the entire royal family on the passing of His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, who died on April 9th at the age of 99. The Duke of Edinburgh visited Canada on numerous occasions throughout his lifetime, including nine times to the city of Vancouver. His first trip to Vancouver was in 1951 when he, when he accompanied then Princess Elizabeth's inaugural visit to Canada. The royal couple visited Vancouver City Hall on October 20th, 1951. In March 1993, the couple visited, the royal couple visited Vancouver City Hall again and were warmly received by city staff and local residents. His last visit to Vancouver was in 2022 before he retired from royal duties in 2017. The Canadian flag at Vancouver City Hall and on civic facilities has been lowered to half mast and will remain at half mast until sunset on Saturday, April 17th, the day of the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral. There are photos of the Duke of Edinburgh's visit to Vancouver City Hall on our website, courtesy of Vancouver, uh, the Vancouver Archives, and a link to a condolences book set up by Heritage Canada. So please join me in a moment of silence to remember his life and many contributions. Thank you very much, Council. I'm going to move on to the plan for the day. Uh, the public is strongly urged to listen to the proceedings via the city's website or YouTube link and follow along on Twitter at Van City Clerk for updates on the progress of the meeting. Video of council members speaking, presentations, amendments, and vote results will be projected to viewers when available. Any comments on agenda items can be sent to council using the web form on the city's website. And that the link will be tweeted out on at Ben City Clerk. I also want to note the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, inclusion, and inclusion, including utmost respect for all genders. I remind Council that when addressing speakers and staff, we will avoid using gendered honorifics and will instead refer to the person by first and last name, role, or title. Today we have uh, three administrative motions, one presentation, three reports, and five referral reports, 11 bylaws, six administrative motions, and three members' motions. We also have notice of council members' motions, uh, new business, inquiries, and other matters. So the plan for today is to uh, carry on and then break at noon for lunch until 1 p.m. 
then we'll go in camera from 1 until 4 p.m. What's on the in-camera agenda council. Then we'll deal with the remainder of the agenda. Just to remember, uh, just a reminder that we have a public hearing this evening that begins at 6. <clears throat> so uh, in camera, council is required to meet in camera later this week. The reasons and authority under the Vancouver Charter are listed in the updated agenda. Someone would like to move the motion to go in camera, please. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor Carr, thank you. All in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. I don't think I heard any nays, so uh, we're, that carries unanimously. Thanks very much. We have a, a bunch of minutes to go through council, three sets of minutes. Minutes one are the minutes of the council meeting of March 30th. Any corrections? Someone like to move? Adoption? So move. Councillor Carr. Thank you. Seconder? Seconded. Councillor Boyle, I heard, I think. Uh, yeah. all, in, all in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Thanks. Minutes two are the minutes of this is the council meeting following the standing committee on city and finance, on city finance and services meeting of March 31st. Any corrections? Mover? So moved. Thank you. Seconder? Councilor Kirby Young. Thank you, Councilor Kirby Young. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thanks very much. Last minute, uh, public hearing, March 11th. Uh, April 1st, 7th, and 8th. Any corrections? Mover? Move so forward. Moved. Second. Thank you. Car. Thank you. Favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Good. Okay, so that finishes minutes. Uh, now, Council, we're going to matters adopted on consent. Um, we, and I just ask you to, to get on the list if you want to hold any of these matters. Uh, we have Reports one to three, referral reports, reports one to five, and we can adopt these all in a single motion. Um, so I've got uh, Councillor Dominato on the list. Did you want to hold a, an item, Councillor Dominato? Uh, thanks, Mayor. I'd like to hold report number two regarding the building bylaw. Okay. Uh, and I've got Councillor Weave. Yeah, I would like to hold report one, waterworks and conservation bylaw. Okay, thanks very much. I, I don't see anybody else on the list. Uh, so does anybody wish to declare a conflict of interest on any on item number three? Don't hear anyone. So can we have a, a motion? motion. Through a so, yeah. Second. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Carr. Thank you, Councillor Carr as a seconder. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay, Council, so we have, um, We've uh, approved uh, report number three, closure and sale of a portion of road adjacent to uh, 150 Robson Street. <clears throat> We've also um, referred, uh, referred items uh, one to five, a CD rezoning on East 12th Avenue, rezoning on 6909 Ash Street, uh, CD1 rezoning on 1885 East Pender Street, uh, CD1 rezoning on 8655 Granville Street and a CD1 rezoning on uh, 8273 Oak Street and 1035 West 67th Avenue. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Council. Um, now we're moving on to presentations, Council. We have one presentation for today, and um, that is from, uh, from the Vancouver Public Library Board, a strategic plan. And we have uh, Christina de Castell and uh, Jennifer Chan from the VPL uh, to present. Clerks, are we ready to go? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor, Council, staff, and listeners at home. I'm Jennifer Chan, Chair of the Vancouver Public Library Board, and I'm joined by, as you heard, Christina de Castell, our Chief Librarian and CEO. I'm delighted to present the library's 2020 to 2023 strategic plan and outline how our priorities and goals align with and help advance Council's priorities. The library is a core part of the services the library, or sorry, that the city provides. And during VPL's closure due to COVID-19, we heard from countless people about how important the library is to their lives. We heard from families looking for help with the learning needs of their young children, adults missing our spaces, 
and seniors isolated at home. So we're really looking forward to getting back to welcoming those 6 million visitors that come through our doors annually. This strategic plan, initially developed at the end of 2019, has helped shape the services we've provided during the pandemic and how we think about what comes next. We're proud of the library's record of meeting our community's needs and introducing innovative services while continually finding new efficiencies. And this plan carries on that tradition. VPL's mission and vision have not changed. They define what we exist to do and who we are. And we began this plan understanding that we are one of the most used libraries in Canada with strong digital services and extensive public programs with 92% of the public being satisfied with the services we offer. So this strategic plan builds on the strong foundation of our previous plans. It delivers the core services that are fundamental to our community while addressing the challenges and opportunities we see moving through and beyond this pandemic. Now I'll briefly share how we reached our goals. Starting in mid 2019, we reviewed the external landscape, undertook an internal assessment and heard from over 5,000 individuals and organizations, including the public, community partners, council and staff. Reflecting on what we heard, the board approved four strategic priorities and 13 goals in December of 2019. We were about to release the plan in March, 2020, when the pandemic struck. And as you know, the pandemic's impact has been profound. From March to May, 2020, VPL was required to temporarily close locations and lay off over 80% of staff due to the pandemic, transforming library services to digital. Gradually, our staff started the work to recover. So before releasing this plan, it was incumbent on the board to reassess our goals in light of the massive impact the pandemic was having and is continuing to have on our community. This slide shows a few of the pandemic impacts we identified and considered in reassessing our goals. What we realized is that almost all of these challenges were already identified before the pandemic and in many cases have been amplified by it. And as a result, we concluded that the strategic priorities and goals we had identified at the end of 2019 were still valid. And in fact, the library's contributions to addressing these challenges is needed even more than before. Our strategic priorities are the four areas where the library will focus our efforts. And within each priority area, we've identified three or four key goals. Before getting into the goals, I emphasize that the library strategic plan is strongly connected to Council's priorities. As a core city service, we make our greatest contributions in the areas of equity and affordability. So you'll see these themes appear throughout our strategies and actions. Providing free access to our collections, technology and spaces for everyone, particularly as one of the only free indoor spaces in Vancouver, means that when individuals and families in Vancouver are struggling financially, they still have access to reading, learning, programs, and technology so that they can participate fully in our community and feel a sense of belonging. At a time of increased occurrences of racism and isolation, this connection to community support is vitally important. VPL has also woven a commitment to truth and reconciliation throughout our plan, building on the work that library has been doing for many years to further the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to support the principles of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples related to language, history, and culture. Our strategic plan recommits to engaging with Indigenous communities, particularly the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, recognizing that the work of the library takes place on their unceded lands. I'll now share more about each of our priorities and goals. Our first strategic priority, learning and creativity, encompasses the most valued and long-standing core offerings of a public library. Free access to collections, resources, programming, and expertise to support lifelong learning, creativity, and an informed community. What continues to evolve is how we achieve this goal. And as I speak to you from home, I think it's clear we've all seen the shift from in-person to digital interaction accelerated as a result of the pandemic. VPL's work on this priority began by transforming adult, teen, and children's programming to fully digital during the pandemic. Our virtual story times continue to support parents and caregivers who rely on the library to support the early literacy of preschool children, 
which is a role that's not filled by any other public service in Vancouver. We've learned that our virtual programs have allowed us to share the library's benefits with many who had previously struggled getting to the library, whether because of financial, time, or mobility barriers, and we'll need to continue to meet this tremendous new demand for our digital programs. The digital shift happened for books and other materials as well. So even now, as the use of physical materials is returning, digital collection use has increased by more than 30%. We also saw the critical role the library plays in providing access to technology and the skills to use it. During the pandemic, our staff helped seniors and others isolated at home to connect with us and with their loved ones. And some of these brand new digital users are still asking for the library support as they build on their new skills. And most of all, 2020 emphasized how important our basic access to computers is. I'm proud to say that VPL was the first library in Canada to restore public computer access during the closures due to COVID-19. And of course, our physical spaces also remain critically important for learning and creativity. We've just opened a new exciting early learning space at the Renfrew branch to support the development of cognitive, physical, and social skills of children aged zero to five. And we can't wait to launch the full range of features once pandemic restrictions ease. The space includes a baby area for our youngest patrons, fine motor opportunities like a light table and a Duplo table, sensory opportunities and creative play choices like magnet walls and build centers. Our second strategic priority is shared spaces and experiences. And this is VPL's commitment to welcoming and providing accessible physical and digital spaces that enable Vancouver residents to engage with information, ideas, and each other. Reflecting Indigenous cultures and history is important in our current and future spaces. And in 2020, staff undertook work to update more than 20,000 records in the library catalog to reflect Indigenous rather than colonial naming practices. As staff plan new branches and service points, we're emphasizing accessibility. In the past year, we've been upgrading our facilities to improve accessibility and support people staying healthy. And we know that library visits will rebound as our hours are restored and gathering restrictions are lifted. VPL is planning new facilities that support the many ways people use our shared spaces, and we'll also be exploring new ways to provide library service as we imagine approaches beyond the concept of a traditional library branch. Two of the major projects that staff are working on related to this goal are the Marple Branch and Oak Ridge Branch redevelopments. Oak Ridge Branch will expand from 13,000 to 25,000 square feet as part of the new Civic Center and become a hub for library service outside of downtown. Our third strategic priority is belonging and connection, fostering a connected community by providing opportunities for social interaction, sharing and informed civic dialogue. And this priority became crucial in 2020. As we were reopening, the public told us repeatedly about the important role the library played in their ability to stay connected and to feel a sense of community. Staff heard from many, particularly those who lived alone or who faced affordability issues, that access to the library's digital programs and collections were lifelines. And that when physical access to libraries was restored, many felt that their lives took a first step towards normal. VPL's work on this goal will continue the digital programs that help people stay connected and eventually will restart in-person programs that build community connection and get people out of their homes to interact with their neighbors. We'll continue to celebrate Indigenous voices through programs such as the Indigenous Storyteller in Residence and support reconciliation through VPL's Indigenous Genealogy Program. In December, Council approved incremental funding for a new Indigenous planner position at VPL, and we're really grateful for this funding that increases our capacity for reconciliation work. And we'll be putting a significant effort into programs that seek to celebrate the diverse cultures that make up Vancouver's population, that combat racism and discrimination, and that support newcomers and those who speak languages other than English. One of the major initiatives for this priority, made possible with Council's budget support, is our effort to eliminate barriers to library service caused by fines. We're planning a fine forgiveness event for 2021, and we're looking forward to inviting people who aren't able to use the library to come back. Our final strategic priority is organizational strength, ensuring we are ready to deliver the services our community needs and that VPL is recognized as vital to Vancouver. 
We've heard how much our patrons appreciate the quality of VPL service and the commitment of our staff. We've also heard from staff that they want the tools and expertise to continue delivering excellent patron-centered service with confidence. We'll invest so that staff can be resilient and responsive to our community. And to provide truly inclusive service, we need our staff to reflect our community. And we'll be working internally to be a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization with a focus on anti-racism. We've learned that many people are not familiar with the full breadth of services available through VPL. So we'll also be increasing awareness and usage through customized promotion to ensure that everyone understands the incredible resources they can access that support their ability to thrive in our city. And staff will undertake measures to ensure continuity of our service to the public through disaster planning, climate change preparedness, and post-disaster recovery. So I'd like to share a few of the comments that we've heard from our patrons on the next slide. Whether it's excitement about library cards for babies and story time in Cantonese, the Indigenous storyteller programs, or the new early learning space at Renfrew, it's incredible to hear so often from the more than 30,000 people who follow the library on social media and share their thoughts. We also love to hear about the ways our most traditional services are appreciated. Like this comment from a patron who wrote their PhD thesis at VPL and said, Writing from the library made me feel less isolated and connected to the community. Libraries are one of the few institutions where everyone is welcome. Libraries raised me. So in conclusion, we're proud of the work that VPL staff undertook in 2020, guided by this strategic plan. And from the exemplary leadership of our chief librarian and CEO, Christina de Castell and her senior leadership team, and right across the organization to every staff person out in our branches and those working behind the scenes and support roles as well. The library has risen to the challenge supporting families with young children and seniors in isolation at home with digital programs, helping countless people interact and learn through Zoom and eBooks, and supporting our community's difficult conversations about racism and inequality through book recommendations and digital programs. We're looking forward to the next few years and all the ways that the library can help council achieve its goals and build a resilient, healthy and engaged Vancouver. So thank you so much again for your support of the library this year and in the past. Christina and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you have. And I'd also like to invite you to consider and let us know how you think the library can best support council's priorities. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, nice to think about post COVID-19 days and going back to the library. So really appreciate that. You do have uh, a whole bunch of questions from councillors. Uh, council, uh, start with Councillor Kirby Young up to five minutes. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Marin. Good morning, Jennifer. Thanks for the presentation and the updates. Always great to hear from the library team. Um, I'm curious um, in terms of perspective around if you think that some of the increased demand or new folks that are accessing the library that wouldn't have previously before the pandemic will sustain afterwards. And related to that, if you think we're equipped to sort of fulfill on that demand and what challenges we might have um, in terms of if we can continue to expand who the library serves and sustain that interest. Yeah, that's a great question because we have seen such a shift in, in the use of libraries as well during the pandemic. What I can say, and I'll refer to Christina to fill in a few more of the operational details on this, but we've already seen a resurgence of people coming back to the library. Demand's been growing. We've had almost uh, 200,000 visits in March with physical circulation of reaching up to half a million items. So uh, we're really seeing people coming back and using our spaces again. We do expect that this demand will continue. And I'll refer over to Christina to speak about some of the thinking behind how we're gonna be sustaining that. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things that's been really remarkable is the, the new digital users for the library and particular those who were not able to participate in physical programs before. So weren't able to visit the library or had reached a point where they weren't using physical materials as much because of eyesight, for example. So it's the most elderly patrons and those with, uh, with physical issues coming to the library that I think we are, we are seeing the most likely interest in that sustained behavior change. And we are really well equipped to meet that. We have 
absolutely one of the strongest digital service complements in Canada. So, so strong, uh, strong website and digital collections and digital licensing. And we've been able to expand that in the past year between the strong support that we have for our collections budget, as well as additional support from our VPL foundation to meet that okay. extra demand. So we're well positioned. Okay, and can I jump in because I've got limited time. What challenges do you think we have ahead in terms of library service in the city? So this increased demand for digital will be challenging to continue to meet if we see it, the physical use restored as well. It is entirely possible that we'll have considerably increased demand. And we'll, also we need some attention to our facilities because of people's heightened interest in maintaining health and worry about being close to each other. So we saw people come back very quickly to physical spaces when we have allowed increased seating. Okay, so more around health precautions and facilities and increased demand in terms of digital licensing or because you, you would say you would think intuitively that digital is more scalable to expand, but is it around licensing or can you be a bit more? Yeah, it is around licensing. So there are restrictions from publishers. Generally, ebooks are sold to us on a two year license. And that means that rather than having a book that sits in the library's collection forever, our money only lasts for two years and we're rebuying content constantly. So that is why we're very involved in advocacy at both the national and international level and why I'm engaged internationally with the World Intellectual Property Organization to try and address these types of issues on an international scale. Okay, great. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much and thanks for the, again for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fry, up to five. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, and thanks, uh, Jennifer, for the presentation and Christina for answering some of uh, the questions. Um, and, and thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm wondering if we could, speaking of work, um, how are our staff? Um, you know, I recognize that library staff were disproportionately impacted through the early shutdowns. Uh, library staff are predominantly women uh, and are, um, you know, faced with some challenging frontline situations. How's their health? How's their um, spirit? And are they getting vaccinated uh, appropriately? Thank you, Councillor Fry, for a very thoughtful question. Certainly, the pandemic, as you noted, had tremendous impacts on staff. And uh, in the presentation, we commented on the very disproportionately high number that experienced layoffs. So of course, this has had a tremendous impact. We're still recovering from that, still having to um, hire as well additional staff to get us back up to the levels where we're able to provide uh, the full services. But what I can say is that a lot, of, a lot of progress has been made. Our staff are incredibly resilient and dedicated, and I can't thank them enough for everything that they're doing all across the library system the amount of commitment has just been absolutely exemplary from everyone. And so uh, there have been challenges, and I think that Christina can speak to more about how this is progressing. But um, overall, what we've been hearing is that based on our commitment to ensuring that staff and patron safety is number one in the reopening process, um, we haven't had any workplace transmissions and, and our safety protocols have been holding. So I'll defer to Christina for filling in some more on that. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll just briefly add that as she, as Jennifer noted, safety protocols are strong. So we've had a few staff cases that were not related to worksite transmission. And that uh, of course raises anxiety for people. We're having a lot of conversations about supporting staff's mental health and also about vaccination access particularly with our union. So really trying to collaborate a lot around safety and around communication to make sure that we're there for people when they need that support. This is a, a time when working in public service raises anxiety, but on the whole, staff have been doing quite well in supporting each other and speaking up when they need that additional, additional support from services like employee, employee and family assistance, which we have. I've I've heard from some staff that they're put in an uncomfortable position where they're having to police uh, COVID protocols like wearing masks and that kind of thing. Are we providing enough security uh, for staff to to do that kind of work, and are they comfortable doing that kind of work? It is difficult for anyone in public service, I think, to 
tackle that conversation with a member of the public who is reluctant to wear a mask. So we have security at several of our locations where that has been necessary. And we provide a lot of support through examples of scripts for those conversations. What's really important with working with the public is being consistent in the application of rules so that everyone knows if you show up in this particular way, you're going to be asked to leave. And so that consistency across our locations is the area where we really work on emphasizing right now whether or not there's a security staff member present. So security is generally in our areas closest to downtown where we awesome. tend to see the most security conflict. Thanks, Christina, and lots of gratitude for our hardworking frontline library staff for sure. Um, just curious, I, I, I heard Jennifer mention the Oak Ridge Library forthcoming. Any uh, any contemplation around, we have stuff coming forward soon around the Collingwood uh, um, area library future. Is that on the radar with folks? We are certainly talking about that, Jennifer, uh, pardon me. I'll, uh, I'll take this one as an operational item. The Collingwood Library, we are having conversations about things like test fits. So what a library could look like in that neighborhood. It is a priority neighborhood for the library board in the library facilities master plan. So certainly we're participating in those conversations and we look forward to a new library branch in that area. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks again, for staff. Thank you. Uh, we have Councillor Boyle next, up to five. Uh, thanks, um, and uh, I'll echo a huge thank you, Jennifer and Christina, and all the library staff who have really uh, been been working hard to meet people's needs and adapt. Um, I also had a few questions about how staff are uh, coping, so appreciate Councillor Fry asking those uh, questions. So my other question was um, just about the fine free. Uh, welcome back week that is being planned this week. If you could uh, tell us a bit more about that um, and what it might look like to uh, expand that into um, a full fine free program and who uh, who benefits uh, or, or, you know, just uh, a little bit more about why that matters so much. Thank you, Councillor Boyle. So absolutely, uh, Fine Free is one of the items that we brought to Council's attention at the end of last year. And what we heard back was that um, more information perhaps was sought and a, a stronger demonstration about the benefits of this. And really where we get that information is from the many places across Canada, across North America, and now even closer to us in the lower mainland that are beginning to adopt Fine Free so that those folks who aren't able to pay their late fines and, and due to those fines aren't able to come to the library are able to return to the service. Um, now, I did mention in the presentation that we're planning a fine free event for 2021, which is funded with the generous support that we received for this trial uh, from the city's budget last year. So uh, Christina can speak a little bit more to where our plans. There are a few things that have changed in terms of timing because of the pandemic, but uh, I'll let her fill you in on that. Thanks, Jennifer. So we are planning a fine free campaign, which would reach out to people who are blocked from borrowing. So when, when someone has more than $10 in library fines, they're not able to continue borrowing from the library until they bring that balance under $10. And we know that the people who are most affected by those library fines and have those block cards are those who live in our lowest income neighborhoods. And that also corresponds to our neighborhoods that have the highest indigenous and black populations. So while we don't gather racialized data, uh, we do know that there's a really strong correlation between those low income neighborhoods and people who are unable to use the library because of block cards. And these are the same groups of people who would benefit from library services the most. So we're very conscious of this and it is a, a change that is happening across North America that library boards are waiving fines and eliminating fines for library service, recognizing that it gets the library perceived as a punitive organization. And in fact, the shared responsibility, what responsibility people have for library materials motivates them to return library materials even without fines. So we are hoping to be able to move to a fully fine free service 
that would require making up a loss of revenue of another $475,000. So the library currently receives $625,000 in revenue annually from library fund. So we're on our way with the investment that the, the council made last year. We are um, very aware this is a, a substantial sum and it is a result of the incredible use of the library that is uh, by people in Vancouver. So we have the strongest circulation per capita in Canada, the most use of library materials and therefore people in Vancouver incur the most fines. So we will be inviting people in a fine forgiveness campaign to come back to the library and have their fines forgiven so that they can start borrowing again and to have a conversation with us about ways to support their borrowing in the future. So I am looking forward to our staff undertaking that in the next few months. Thank you. Great, I'm looking forward to it too. I'm also curious if the shift to more digital use um, would lead to um, reduced uh, fine revenue. I know revenue is the wrong way to talk about fines, but um, if we would expect to be seeing a decline in the number of fines coming in anyway, as, as there's a shift to digital over time? Yes, Councillor Boyle, that's, ex that's absolutely right, because as you know, many of the digital uh, materials can be returned automatically, and so there often would not be a fine for those anyway. And so we'll see that with the shift towards digital that our expected fine revenue would decrease in any event. And one thing I wanted to point out as well is that we are in the process of gathering more information to support your, support your funding decision with regard to fines. And um, we've conducted a preliminary survey and it's really exciting that we've learned that 63% of respondents support eliminating library fines and that the strongest support is amongst patrons under 44, where we see 70 to 80% supporting the elimination of fines. And this isn't uh, a support that's driven by income level. So income level is not a factor in that degree of support. So we are certainly seeing that the people in Vancouver are, are behind this initiative. Okay, that's great. I suspect as people hear and think more about it that um, those numbers may shift more too. So excited to see this pilot and um, yeah, again, thanks for all your work. That's, those are all of my questions, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we have Councillor Swanson up to five. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, thanks to uh, all of the library staff this, and sorry some of them were laid off and thank them for all their work. Um, I wanted to ask about fines too. Um, are you guys in the library planning to bring forward a proposal that we could put in the next budget to actually go completely fine free? Yeah, Councillor Swanson, that's uh, something that is our current intention. It's something that we brought forward last year and we would plan that that would go forward for this year as well with the added support of all the information that we're going to be gaining through our uh, fine free initiative and welcoming back folks. So you'll see an even stronger presentation this year than you did last year, subject to, of course, the board approving it going forward. There is a process that we go through for identifying our, um, our budget. And so it's not only up to me, but I can say that from what I know, that's where we'll be heading. Okay, that's great. Um, thank you so much. That's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Councillor Carr? Yes, um, thank you. And uh, may I first just again, um, like my fellow councillors, really emphasize how important the work is that you do. And thank you for that and a, a great presentation, but just all the work you do, um, both uh, Jennifer and Christina and all your staff. Um, my question is really arising, uh, other questions have been answered already um, around the comment you made, Jennifer, regarding um, resilience and the importance of the libraries uh, as being places, safe spaces um, for resilience, especially um, as we're looking at um, climate change type um, does, um, emergencies. It might be air quality or heat waves or those kinds of things. So could you tell me just a bit more of the thinking of the library in terms of, um, and especially within the context of the Vancouver plan, uh, which is right now focusing on resilient neighborhoods. So the role that libraries and branches could play at a neighborhood level as spots of refuge and safety for health and in a, in a climate emergency. Yeah, 
Thank you, Councillor Carr. So I think some of the thinking that goes behind this comment on resilience really speaks to the fact that social infrastructure has been shown in so many examples to strengthen the resilience of community because of the importance that connection has in terms of ensuring that folks are able to look out for each other, reach out and check on each other and see if you're okay, especially for anyone that lives in a more isolated situation where they might not have as broad of a family or friends circle uh, to, to be able to be there for them. Being able to go to a place like a library or another social infrastructure uh, space where they're able to build those connections and engage and be an active member of their community increases their chances of being able to be resilient in any kind of crisis situation, whether that's living through a pandemic or uh, whatever other things that we need to prepare for in a climate change uh, emergency. So that's part of our thinking, absolutely, in terms of how social infrastructure, like the library, can really support folks in, in becoming resilient. And of course, you know, I'll have to put in a plug for one of our library books, Palaces for the People by Eric Kleinenberg is one of our favorites to recommend for anyone that wants to read up more on the tremendous value that social infrastructure like the library has for resilience. And that's, of course, one of the books that we have several copies of at the library, and I'd be happy to point you to it. Thank you. I love reading, so that's great. Um, just uh, on that same theme, um, Metro Vancouver is also putting out a public call right now for input on a plan around resilience and is um, specifically noted also the need for um, places within neighborhoods and communities where people can go. As I say, especially um, if there is something like, um, you know, the wildfires in 2018 that created such poor air quality and I uh, really had a lot of people suffering um, around that, whose homes were sort of not resilient. Um, what would it take for libraries? I mean, it would require, um, I guess, upgrading, but uh, for and retrofitting. Um, but do you have right now good air filtration? Could you know air exchanges and um, those kinds of things really? be, um, if there was funding available, um, be uh, an addition to libraries that, that could help um, increase the uh, resilient nature of libraries in the face of, of that kind of a health emergency. Mm -hmm, certainly, and I will defer to our chief librarian on this one. I know she has been thinking about clean air in particular ventilation issues related to the pandemic. So over to you, Christina. Thank you, Jennifer. So our branches are in different states as far as their HVAC systems. Central Library has one of the best HVAC systems. So it's a very large building with a, a good system that, that is available to people when they need a refuge for clean air. And we certainly saw people taking advantage of that during the wildfire at smoke impacts and air impacts. So that is something we're quite aware of. We have looked at all of our HVAC systems across the city and the kinds of upgrades that would be needed. So we work quite closely on this with the city's real estate and facilities management department to prioritize across the library and community center facilities. And we're, we will be continuing to do that to be better prepared to provide clean air shelters in addition to the warming and cooling that libraries always provide when the weather is extreme because we are one of the only places for people to go during the day. So yeah, I'm, I'm out of time, but I'd love to get that information. That's fantastic. You're doing that work. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last on the list, uh, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and, and thanks, Christina and Jennifer and the team um, uh, for the update. I really appreciate that um, uh, you took some time in the context of, of COVID to sort of reassess uh, the strategic plan, and um, I've always known uh, public libraries to be uh, some of the most sort of resilient and adaptable kind of organizations in our society. And hearkening back to a time when I was manager of public libraries provincially, and and so I, I'm really fascinated by the the work that you've done and and how resilient you've been over this period of time. But I'm curious, um, in addition to the broad goals and articulated objectives of the strategy, if if you could speak to what you see as um, the kind of further opportunities on the horizon um, uh, for public libraries because they have adapted. Um, uh, it really, they aren't about books anymore, just simply books. And it's just I'm curious if you see um, other opportunities on the horizon um, for uh, VPL. 
Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> Certainly, I think we're always looking to not only be responsive to the changing needs that we're seeing because of things like the pandemic or what we're hearing from folks in our community-led initiatives, but also to try to be proactive and think beyond what the library looks like today to what it could be in the future. And this is something that we do each time we look at this strategic plan and some of the really interesting conversations really around how um, connections are formed among community members and whether or not the library can transform in new ways as we, we this is something we already do but what new ways can we provide where folks can come and share their ideas and a place like vancouver with so many diverse people and communities and cultures how we can be a, an opportunity for people to come and express themselves and share who they are with each other so that we can have a more connected fabric in our community i think that's some of the areas that are very interesting, but also looking at, as you'll see in the presentation, talking about ways the library can offer services beyond what a traditional library looks like. There's ways in which we're exploring that with pop-up libraries. We have a library book van that brings our services to other places. Um, and, you know, I'll open it up to Christina as well, because she's been a really a visionary speaker on this type of thing and has really guided our thinking as well. Thanks, Jennifer. So I'll just briefly add, uh, on top of what Jennifer was saying about community connection, the opportunities for the space for the, for the library as a space of civic dialogue where people can work on issues together and plan action, I think is quite important. It is really a way for neighborhoods and a place for neighborhoods to come together when we all live in smaller spaces. And so that's one of our major areas of opportunity. And the other is around how technology is evolving and ensuring that we don't leave people behind as the world changes and technology becomes more and more in a way that we, uh, we enable connection. So we really recognize in libraries that this is not something available to everyone. And when people are curious about how augmented reality, virtual reality, all of these sorts of things are going to affect their lives, that that is a role that the library can support is helping people to understand as we move in towards a more automated future, what it means for us as a society and to get that exposure when you can't afford to do that yourselves, when you can't afford to access those types of technology. So we really help to bring everyone along and that is a significant role as we start to look towards a more technology affected future. So those are two areas that we're paying a lot of attention to and thinking about. That's fantastic, and I and I appreciate that. And I've 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 uh, you know been honored to enjoy uh, you know events and other gatherings and dialogues at the VPL. And and I know it's been I was actually down there a few weeks ago with my daughter, and it was incredibly busy. And staff were incredibly helpful as we were trying to find books. My last question is on community partnerships, and it is around. Uh, if you could just describe sort of our relationship with um, our local universities and colleges in the context of, of resources and, and what kind of relationships we have with uh, post-secondary. Christina, I think I'll send this question to you. Sure. So. And that's one of the major areas where libraries have have worked together for many, many years so that anyone in Vancouver can access the full breadth of university collections through interlibrary loan. So that is a service that still exists and still matters. Our Vancouver residents are strong users of interlibrary loan from the, from the universities is one of the most important partnerships we have there. And then on the programming front, we have quite a lot of partnerships with individual departments among universities. One of the places we work with quite a bit is SFU, both the public square and the center for dialogue. So lots of conversations there about how we can strengthen community connections and community dialogue and work together on addressing change. So that's a couple of examples. So both on collections and on programs, we work with the universities. Thanks so much. Great, thank uh, you. And I think that's my time, but thank you for your fantastic work and your teams. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, that's it for uh, questions from Council. So just wanted to thank you so much for your presentation and everything you do. We all love libraries. So thanks for keeping ours in such great shape. Thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at our libraries as well. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you again. Thanks again. And Council, we're going to move on now to um, 
the reports that were held. Uh, first of all, the, so the two reports were held were on the Waterworks and Conservation Bylaw Amendments and uh, the uh, miscellaneous changes to building bylaws and electrical bylaws. I'm just wondering if any councillors wish to declare a conflict of interest on any of these items or these two items. Okay, um, right. So let's start with the uh, Councillor Weeby who held waterworks and conservation bylaw amendments. Did you have specific questions? Um, I did. I also recognize that there will be a staff report on drinking water demand management. They'll come back to this council in the fall. Um, because one of the things I was interested in is recognizing that 2020, our Greenest City Action Goal was to reduce water consumption by 33% and we've only gone to 26. So I was wondering what was our goal, but it looks like that will be coming to this council in the fall. So my question to staff on this report is, it talks about um, that we were able to do metering for all residential homes, 0.4 acres and larger. I'm wondering how that process um, was implemented and was there any conversation about looking at reducing the acreage to get more homes on this project, recognizing we're only at 11%? Uh, city manager, do you have a uh, staff person there to answer these questions? Thanks, Mayor Stewart. Yeah, we do. Uh, Andrea Becker is on the line, I believe, um, and I would defer to her uh, for that question. Thanks so much. Uh, please yes. go ahead. Yes, thanks, Paul. Um, yes, definitely I uh, can respond about the um, the initiative that we took on last summer to meter the remaining uh, large um, residential properties above 0.4 acres. And so we used internal, uh, our internal water operations workforce to complete, I think it was about 225 additional meter installs on those large properties and move them to the metered rate. Um, and so part of the update, um, one of the updates in the bylaw today is to actually just remove uh, the remaining like um, area based um, comment for metering because the advice we've received from legal was that our bylaw allows us to meter any property. It's more the bylaw is meant to um, meant to indicate what customers are obligated to do. So we have the notes in there that all new residential or renovated residential properties require a meter. And so we're slowly increasing our residential metering. Um, but we do um, have the ability to essentially meter any property um, going forward. And so part of our demand management strategy that you mentioned um, will focus on how we can accelerate residential metering. And then this allows us to sort of have the flexibility to do that. We're not restricted so, by the, the size of the property. Yeah, I noticed that that was crossed off in the red line. So you're stating today this housekeeping work will allow us to better have tools when you guys come back with the drinking water demand management plan to showcase what initiatives and incentives we can do or what properties we look at to um, kind of reduce our water system loss as a city? Exactly, yeah. And most of the other minor changes are more just outdated language. So we're coming up to the water restriction season, May 1st. And so there were just some sort of overlapping language or um, little things that were missed over the years. So we wanted to clean those up so that um, we were better equipped for the enforcement season. Okay, and did we see a lot of difference in our water consumption use due to COVID? And then I want, so my second question would be recognizing that 6.1 talked about the drinking water fountains and the water quality monitoring, um, recognizing that a lot of our access to water was shut down because of COVID. I'm just wondering um, if you know if that testing is being done and yes. if we expect more access to water this summer, recognizing that we're still in COVID protocols. Yes, I can try and split those up. So the first question was that, um, did we see an impact in water demand because of COVID? And yes, we definitely did. Um, the restrictions, COVID restrictions, definitely had an impact on the economy as we all know. And so we did see that reflected in lower water use in our ICI sector. Um, but conversely, because a lot of people were at home, instead we did see a um, little bit of an increase overall uh, in residential use. And so um, we, I think it was about probably 10% more, 
lower overall water use in 2020. And so um, sort of the, the reduction in ICI and a little bit of a boost in residential, um, what sort of that was the overall outcome. And so we expect um, that will probably continue into 2021. Um, and so we're monitoring that closely. And then okay. your other question, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, can you refresh me on the other question? The other question was ask access to water, recognizing that yes. we shut down a lot of our. Yes, definitely. And so our team um, is working closely with EOC on access to water. So we um, we actually deployed a lot of hand washing stations in downtown Eastside um, near the beginning of the pandemic. We had to take them out during the winter because of freezing risks and hazards, but um, they are going to be deployed again in addition um, to a number of temporary drinking fountains as well. And that is also um, a main focus going forward is increased access to water, recognizing water as a human right. That's great. And then I guess last question, looking at my time, um, are we gonna see any water conservation pilots this summer that we can showcase to our public that we're going to be a part of this kind of program to reduce our water conservation. So are we got any capital projects or any projects that will be delivered this summer um, prior to the report coming to us in the fall? We don't have any pilot projects this summer. Um, a lot of the work happening um, throughout the year is more preparation for um, larger, larger capital projects later in the capital plan. Perfect, thank you very much. Thanks, Thank I don't see any other questions, Councillor Weed, would you like to move this uh, report? Yeah, I'll move the report. Thanks, do we have a second? Thank yep. you, Councillor Carr. All the yeas and nays, uh, all in favor, yay? Yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Great, so uh, thanks very much, that's unanimous. And the second report is on the uh, building electrical bylaws. Uh, Councillor Dominato, you uh, held this one. I just gonna check with the city manager. Do you have somebody, uh, you have some staff there able to answer questions? Uh, yes, um, Mayor Stewart, we do. Okay, great. Kevin Councilor. Lowe and Pat Fry on the line. So yeah, happy to address any questions. Hey, Councilor Dominato, up to uh, five minutes. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and, and thanks, staff. I, I just wanted to hone in on um, the amendments related to accessibility that were articulated in the report and reflected in, in the Appendix C. Uh, Councillor Fry and I recently had meetings with respect to accessibility of our, our uh, particularly multiple dwelling uh, buildings in the city and the conversation actually centered a lot around um, bathrooms and uh, partly not being large enough and wide enough, but also uh, roll in showers and opportunities for that. And so I wondered if staff could just expand on um, what is articulated here and um, and what feedback they've had from the community in terms of uh, like our persons with disabilities committee and others. Hi, Councillor, this is Kevin Lau, uh, building policy engineer. Um, if I could respond to that. Um, so, uh, earlier on, um, I guess uh, a number of months back, uh, we met with, with uh, the uh, Persons with Disability Committee as uh, through the uh, citywide accessibility uh, plan uh, to have some conversations with them. Um, we've also uh, talked with uh, various industry representatives, uh, architects, CPs, uh, designers uh, in the community. And we've understood that there has been obviously some uh, confusion with regards to the adaptability requirement. Um, the adaptability requirements are intended to address the capacity of a dwelling to be modified in the future to increase the degree of accessibility. And most of the confusion that seem to exist uh, around um, sizing and so forth uh, seem to exist as a consequence of some of the flexibility provisions that we have in there, which allow for um, providing rather than a three piece, a two piece washroom uh, with a future capacity for modification to allow a, uh, a low barrier shower. And so what the, uh, the pieces that have been added into the, um, into the appendix notes uh, as part of uh, this set of changes or proposed changes uh, is intended to provide clarity as to what the chief field officials office would accept as part of those flexibility provisions. Otherwise, um, the, the, the changes uh, that have been proposed uh, only provide uh, only are, are very minor in nature. Like the majority of these are non-binding changes in the in the notes to provide that clarity for industry. So there isn't that kind of confusion and there is clarity as to what kind of sizing is appropriate. So those notes include uh, statements with regards to the need for three by three 
uh, three three foot by three foot uh, uh, shower compartments uh, or, or three three by four or three by five, uh, and those are based on uh, standard sizes um, that uh, are uh, easily found uh, in the in the in industry that uh, comply with the U.S. ADA requirements, for example. And, and can you just um, I'm just curious if um, uh, so this speaks to sort of adaptability of units and is there an expectation though with any new builds that all units would be adaptable um, under our building code? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, uh, that is the currently the requirement. There's there's no change to that. Uh, adaptability is still a mandatory requirement under Vancouver Building by law, unlike the provincial requirements. Okay, and and can I ask a further question? Is do we um, is there do we mandate uh, whether it be through the building code or otherwise or their policy or regulation um, uh, to have dedicated um, accessible units within new builds in the city um, so that if you are looking and, and thinking about an individual who's looking who's in the market to either rent or buy um, and um, an actual units that were already outfitted as fully accessible um, and is, does that exist do we have any requirements for that so right now for uh, multifamily dwellings. Uh, the, Vancouver has a set of uh, enhanced accessibility requirements that must be applied uh, for all um, for all dwelling units. Uh, these uh, these require a certain set of changes that increase in, uh, accessibility and include some adaptability requirements. Uh, further to this, as I said, all uh, dwelling units, all new dwelling units, are required to be ex adaptable. Uh, and my understanding is there may also be some um, mandate for fully accessible units as a part of the the, the, zo the zoning and development uh, planning, but that's uh, that's outside our direct scope, scope. of uh, okay. responsibility. And and then last question: um, Is there anything within um, the uh, building code around accessible door openers? Um, uh, and, and that question came up as well in the context of our meetings. Just 10 yes, seconds. Yes, there is. There is, okay. Yep. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, Councillor, we have up to five minutes. Yeah, I guess a quick follow-up. Mine's probably the city manager. I know in 2018 that they had an accessible report come to council that was referred back that did talk about some of the aspects that Councillor Dominato has brought up today. And I'm just wondering when this council will get that report back on the accessibility options um, that were brought to council in 2018, including some of those accessible guidelines. Thanks, Councillor Weave. I can take that question away and get back to council with uh, an update on that. Perfect. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Thanks. Uh, could somebody move the report? So moved. So moved. I heard Councillor uh, Kirby Young, seconded by Councillor Dominato. Uh, all in favor say yay. 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 Opposed say nay. Great, that's passed unanimously. Thank you, Council. Uh, we're on to by bylaws next. We have 11 bylaws on the agenda. Council members who are not present for the meetings uh, must confirm that they have both reviewed the proceedings and that they wish to vote. Uh, bylaw two is from the public hearing of April 2nd. Councillor Hardwick, uh, have you reviewed the proceedings and will you be voting? I have and I will. Great, okay. Bylaws nine and 10 are from the public hearing of February 25th. Councillor Bly, have you reviewed the pr proceedings and will you be voting? I have and I will. Thanks. Uh, does any member wish to hold any of these bylaws for debate, separate vote, or for conflict of interest? Uh, Councillor Swanson? Yeah, I'd like to hold one, six, seven, nine and 10. Uh, you can hold them in a block if you want. I just want to uh, vote against them so I can have consistency in my votes here. One, six, seven, nine and 10. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Councillor Kirby Young. I'd like to hold bylaw five for a separate vote, please. Okay. Okay, thanks so much. And um, okay, clerks, why don't we? Uh, um, sorry, I was on the list as well. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Hardwick. Yes, I'd like to hold 11, please, for separate vote. Okay. Uh, okay. 
So would somebody like to move to adopt bylaws uh, two, three, four, two, three, and four? Moved, Hardwick. Thank you, seconder. Hard. Mayor, Mayor, um, bylaw eight as well. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see. Yep. Okay. So two, three, four, and eight. I heard Councillor Hardwick. Are you willing to move the yes. addition? Of eight? Okay. Yes. Thanks. And um, seconder. Second, Councillor Carr. Thanks very much. So all in favor, say yay. 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 Okay. Opposed, say nay. Thanks. That that carries unanimously. Uh, let's then move on to the the items that Councillor Swanson held, and we could do those all at once. So could I have somebody move uh, bylaws one, six, seven, nine, and ten? So move, Councillor. Thank Carr. you. We have a seconder. Second, Council Bly. Hey, thanks. And I'm going to call a, a manual, uh, an online vote now, just because I know it won't be unanimous. Councillor Bly and Councillor Fry. Great. So that passes uh, with Councillor Hardwick and Swanson in opposition. Uh, the next we'll move to uh, bylaw number five. And um, we'll also call a, a vote, uh, just a recorded vote on that one. Point of information or point of order. Uh, sure, Councilor. I'll declare I'll declare a code of conflict on this uh, uh, conflict. due yeah, to the recognizing conflict. that I have a business that sells alcohol that could be consumed on city-owned property. Okay, thanks very much, Mayor. We also need a mover and seconder on this bylaw. Sorry about that. Happy to move it, Mayor. Moved. Yeah. Councilor Fry, Councilor Dominado, seconder. seconder. Thanks very much. Okay, now we can have the vote. Uh, Councillor, uh, if you could mark Councillor Weave as in conflict to staff. Great. Okay, that passes with Councillor Hardwick and Councillor Kirby Young in opposition. And finally, we have the item number 11. I need somebody to move that. So moved, uh, so moved. I think I heard Councillor Kirby Young, I think, moved it. I believe that was oh, Brian Bly. Okay, Councillor. Sorry, sometimes it's hard to distinguish the voice. Uh, Councillor Bly, seconded by Councillor Fry. We'll call a vote on this one. And that passes with Councillor Hardwick in opposition. Thanks, uh, Council. We're at 1038. Um, moving on to administrative motions. Uh, six administrative motions on the agenda. The first one is approval of form development of 435 Boundary Road. Anybody wish to declare a conflict of interest on this? I don't hear anyone. Uh, are there any questions to staff council? I don't see anybody on the list. So would somebody like to move the motion? So, so moved. Oh, second. Okay. Uh, Councilor Dominato seconded by Councilor Carr. Uh, I don't see anybody on the list for discussion. So we'll call yeas and nays. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Yay. I heard a nay. Yep. Councillor, Councillor Swanson. Okay. Uh, so we'll need a recorded vote on this. Okay, and that passes with Councillor Swanson in opposition. Moving to um, moving to the approval of form of development 444 uh, Kootenay Street. Anybody wish to declare a conflict of interest? I don't hear anyone. Uh, questions to staff? I don't see anyone on the queue. Someone would like to move this? So move, Councillor Carr. Thank Councillor Carr, seconder. second. Second, Councillor Weeb. Councillor Weeb, thank you. It's on the main queue now. Any discussion? I don't see any. Uh, okay, I'll call yeas and nays. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Okay, that's passed unanimously. Thanks, Council. On to number three, uh, 2710 Caslow Street. Uh, any conflicts of interest? 
questions to staff. Someone like to move this. So move, Councillor Carr. Councillor Carr, seconder. Kirby Young. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, any discussion now in the main queue? Don't see any, so I'll call yeas and nays. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thanks very much. That's uh, passed unanimously. Got a few more of these, Council. Uh, number four is the closure and sale of a portion of road adjacent to uh, one, uh, 150 Robson Street. Any conflicts? Questions, staff? Yeah, questions to staff. Yeah, okay. Councilor Weave, go ahead. Up the, uh, just making sure the city manager has somebody available there. Uh, thanks, Mayor Stewart. I see uh, Jason Olenek uh, from planning is is on. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Weave. Yeah, my question is recognizing that we're seeing um, a goal to do groves of forests or small pocket parks in dense urban centers, recognizing the health benefit, mostly the mental health benefit of these little groves. Was this property ever deemed as an opportunity to create a little natural space in the middle of a very dense and urbanized cement area. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Jason, are you able to assist with that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, we did not look at this as a uh, opportunity for a dense grove. Um, however, we did look at uh, tree retention and there is some tree retention possibilities uh, on the uh, uh, up front corner. Um, but this is not uh, one where we were able to uh, due to the dense retention due to the uh, building floor plate and uh, footprint. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Can uh, somebody move the motion then? Kirby Young. Thanks. Seconder? Second. Right. Thanks, Councillor Carr. Uh, discussion? I don't see any, so I'll call yeas and nays. All in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thanks. That's passed unanimously. Uh, just two left, Council. This is approval of form of development 2235 East Broadway. Anybody wish to declare a conflict of interest? Okay, are there questions to staff? Okay, somebody like to move the motion? I'll move. I'll move. I'll second. Uh, I think I heard Councillor Dominato seconded by Councillor Carr. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thanks. That carries unanimously. Last one, uh, Council approval of form of development 6161 Canby Street. Anybody wish to declare a conflict of interest? Oh, uh, questions to staff? I don't see anybody on the queue. Uh, so we have a mover of the motion, please. So, so move, move Council Bly. Councillor Bly, Councillor Carr, seconder. Uh, any discussion? I don't see any. Okay, yeas and nays. All in favor, yay. 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 Okay, thank you. Uh, opposed, nay. Thanks very much, Council. That uh, that carries unanimously. Okay, uh, Council, we have uh, three Council member motions on the agenda today. Just a reminder that Council members have Two minutes to introduce their motion and one minute each to ask clarifying questions of the mover. Uh, we've got, uh, sorry, I'm just going to clear clear the queue here and um, just put us on the question queue. Um, so motion one is providing bus ridership during COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, so Councillor Swanson, you have up to two minutes whenever you're ready. Yeah, so I'm the one of the liaisons to the Seniors Advisory Committee. And we have the presentation on both bus balancing, which means cutting out bus stops. And all the committee members who spoke uh, after the presentation didn't want the stops cut out. And they kept citing what happens if you are permanently or temporarily disabled and you have to walk the extra distance. And then the West End Seniors Network told me that they opposed the cuts and that they weren't consulted and then the Riley Park South Canby Community Vision Steering Committee said that they opposed the cuts. 
and the Jewish Seniors Alliance of Greater Vancouver said that they oppose. And so then I was thinking with transit ridership at only 40% of normal because of COVID, um, there's lots of riders that don't see the signs that, that TransLink puts up on the stops, which is a good idea. They put up a sign that says, we're thinking of cutting this stop out. But if you're holed up at home, which would primarily be the folks who are disabled and more vulnerable, uh, they don't see those signs and they can't con um, comment on them. So it seems to me that this is a really bad time to cut bus stops out. Um, maybe if they're in the same block, but not when they're 800 meters apart. And at the very least, we need consultation that affect a real consultation that affects the pe that it hits the people where the people who are affected can consult and say what they think should happen. And I also, in terms of the fare increases, I think it's just a principle of equity that we shouldn't increase fares and that we should, in fact, be trying to decrease fares wherever we can. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. You do have a question for up to one minute by Councillor Kirby. Yeah. Yeah, a few questions, I'll be fast. In Clause A, Councillor Swanson, I'm wondering why you're favoring workers of unions and not all lower income and marginalized workers who don't have the benefit of being part of a union. Well, all workers is fine. I just thought union would be a handy way of reaching a large number of workers. Okay, I'll probably anticipate bringing an amendment on that. In Clause B, are you referring more specifically to select? Right-hand turns, for example, at busy intersections or others, or are you suggesting barring all right-hand turns? Oh, select. Okay, um, that's also helpful clarification. Um, and then on C, a lot of those workers at TransLink are unionized. So if those there are no fair increases, how do you propose they continue to increase the wages for the unionized workers at TransLink? Well, I think we need to have a, an equitable tax system that funds public services that everybody needs. I think that's my time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is it for questions, Councillor Swanson. Um, Can I refer this till tomorrow because there's speakers? We just need somebody to second the motion first. Second right. Hardwick. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Yep, so we do have speakers. So uh, Councillor Hardwick, you've moved the um, move the uh, motion to hear this uh, tomorrow, April, uh, Wednesday, April 14th, and we start at 9.30 a.m. Uh, so we have a seconder. Fry. Thank you. All in favor for referral, say yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thanks, so that's referred to the Standing co Committee tomorrow, which starts at 9.30 a.m. Uh, second motion is a joint uh, Vancouver, Vancouver City Council, Vancouver School Board Committee to collaborate on capital projects. Uh, Councilor Carr, you have up to uh, two minutes uh, to introduce this motion. Great. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, I think, uh, Council, you'll remember that we received a request, all of us, uh, for this joint VSB City Council Committee to collaborate on uh, capital projects. The letter came from Chair Carmen Cho uh, um, March 1st, and I raised it in inquiries on March 9th and um, through uh, questions to the acting city manager um, received the direction that the best way to move forward with this would be through a member's motion. Uh, so I submitted that motion. Um, staff did provide feedback and suggested consideration um, in the future regarding the park board. So I did add that um, into the motion. Um, the motion does set out the process for the establishing such a committee. Um, and I, I think just to um, reiterate really the, the points that, that um, I think all of us have discussed before around this, which is the need for collaboration on projects um, is great. We are seeing an increased number of projects coming from the school board um, and their capital planning that do incorporate elements that are the city's jurisdiction like child care, um, in, in one case also housing um, uh, down in, um, in Cole Harbor. Britannia is another uh, incredible example of uh, 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 collaboration, for example, with library and the West End um, Community Center as well uh, and school project. So. Um, I think that we could really benefit all of us and the projects would benefit um, by that collaborative work between um, council and the VSB. 
you, Councillor Carr. A couple of questions, uh, Councillor Kirby Young, up to uh, one minute. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Carr. On 1B, you've asked for a budget for this committee, and I'm wondering, since this committee can meet twice, and I would anticipate most of the costs would come related to capital project budgets, why does it need a budget, and what do you envision that being? You know, I don't imagine that it's going to be a large budget, actually, uh, Councillor Kirby Young, but in I don't know yet what staff will come up with and if there is um, an, an, an additional need um, for any staffing. I, I don't anticipate that it wasn't raised by staff, um, but I thought just to be um, on the cautious side in case there is um, that the timing should be such that it can meet the needs of this particular budget year because it's a very short term project. It's only so it just jump into the time. So you don't see a budget being pivotal to the work of the no, committee. I do not. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hey, Councillor Dominato up to a minute. Uh, thanks, Mary. Thanks, Councillor Carr. Um, I'm just curious if you could expand on what you envision the mandate of this committee being and, and how that fits with the existing um, staff level. There's already existing staff level uh, regular meetings and committees with respect to capital. So what would be the role of uh, council and trustees in this? Uh, well, because the idea came from school board, I'd love to have them answer that question. Um, but uh, but in, from my point of view, I know that um, things have been raised in terms of the potential for um, other types of uh, community needs being met within a school. Um, and I don't know what those are. I think counselors may come up with ideas. We certainly know that child care has been a big one. Maybe there's more housing that we want to incorporate into school projects. It might be other types of facilities, senior centers. Um, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily knowing what that might be. Maybe it is also working with school board around um, retrofitting of schools in order to meet our climate emergency goals um, and ensuring that schools do incorporate um, all of the measures to make sure that they are going to be zero net energy into the future. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Thanks so much, uh, Councillor Boyle. Up to uh, a minute. Uh, thanks. I'm just um, interested in hearing a bit more, Councillor Carr, about how you envision this political committee would um, relate to the uh, staff work that's been uh, ongoing between the bodies. Yes, I received really um, uh, solid and extensive feedback from staff on this, and they um, anticipate that this would be something they would relish in terms of uh, working. Um, so not only school board and, and park board, sorry, school board and the council working uh, between us, but that staff also would uh, provide supplementary um, information and I think gain from those discussions. So I, my sense is that it would be overall a collaborative effort that does include staff in the end too. Great, really appreciate it, thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's it for questions. So do we have a seconder for this motion? I'm, I'm happy to second it, Second. There. Uh, thank you, Councillor Boyle. I heard first. Uh, so we've received requests to speak uh, yeah. tomorrow. Somebody like to move referral. Refer. Yeah, I'll refer it to yes, tomorrow. Refer. Different speakers. Sorry. Okay. That too. Sorry. I. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> Councillor Boyle. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. I got three voices at once there. Um, okay. All in favor? Of referral. Yay. 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 Okay. Opposed? Nay. Great. So that's referred to tomorrow. Uh, the next motion we have is enhancing organizational governance and development. Um, this is moved by Councillor Dominato. Just so you know, Council, uh, there are no speakers signed up to this uh, motion, so we'll be debating this uh, now. So uh, we'll give uh, Councillor Dominato the two minutes to um, to uh, introduce this motion, and please go ahead whenever you're ready, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to introduce this. Um, this stems from um, a number of observations uh, since being elected to um, City Council, uh, as well as uh, the fact that we are in a transition phase, as, as uh, the public knows, uh, we are in the midst of a, a recruitment for a, a permanent city manager and uh, near completion of that uh, process. And so uh, this really endeavors to uh, take a review um, of our governance framework in the context of uh, the governance and management relationship. Uh, to me, the timing uh, is, is perfect, uh, given that we are 
in the midst of this recruitment process uh, around a city manager and to really ensure that we have alignment um, uh, as I note uh, the board of administration bylaw is the bylaw that uh, sets out the powers and duties of the city manager um, it's not actually articulated in the charter and this hasn't been reviewed in almost 30 years um, as well I think there's a really important uh, opportunity here uh, to ensure that any other governance and management linkages policy frameworks are up to date and there's a really clear understanding on the part of both council members as well as staff about the respective roles and responsibilities. And, and so that's the spirit in which it's brought forward as well as looking at ensuring there's a strong onboarding process uh, for as new council members come on as well as throughout the term, which is a, just part of good governance of any kind of organization. So um, that's the, the spirit of which I bring it forward. And I, I think the timing uh, is appropriate. Okay, thanks. Uh, Councillor Boyle, up to a minute for questions. Thanks. Um, this, our council has had a pretty comprehensive orientation, so I'm wondering if, if the idea is this would just uh, embed that or, or really what the intended outcome is of this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would agree there was a strong orientation around um, department issues and policy frameworks and existing strategies, um, but I would suggest that the um, orientation around governance and roles and responsibilities and the sort of the duties of whether it be elected council or a nonprofit board could be strengthened. Um, and that's my estimation from uh, having done governance training, but also having served on boards that, that this council could benefit from that, but also future councils. And, and that's uh, why I bring it forward. And I think it's, it's a bit to build on uh, what we had, but I do think there's opportunities for growth and improvement. Okay, thank you, Councillor Swanson, up to a minute. I wonder if you've thought of, should it be our own staff that are advising us of this, or should we have something more independent, maybe something run by the UBCM that's um, relevant to all municipal um, councillors and mayors, um, and not so embedded in the actual policies and work of, of a specific council? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, Councillor Swanson. I certainly think there's always benefit in having a third party uh, engage with whether it be an elected council board or nonprofit or other type of corporate board in this work. Um, having have done that with, uh, I've done that in nonprofits as well as at school board, uh, and there certainly is benefit uh, from doing that. Uh, so certainly that could be something that's explored. Uh, I didn't want this to be prescriptive, but I think it is something that could be explored by staff as a recommendation. Okay, thank you so much. That's just a minute. Okay, so we have a seconder for this motion. Second, Councillor Weep. I heard Councillor Weep. Um, okay, Council, so I'm going to move us to the main queue. And would anybody like to debate this? Please put yourself on the queue. Councillor Boyle, up to five minutes. Thanks, Mayor. I have a point of information through you to to um, the city manager or staff, which is uh, just to get a sense of um, the staff time uh, that staff interpret would be involved in this um, and I guess what staff and what else would get pushed off, if anything, the, the plate to do this work. Thank you, uh, city manager. Thanks, Mayor Stewart. Uh, and through you to Council Board for the question. So yeah, we haven't done a detailed assessment, of course, of kind of what would be entailed here as work. It would it would generally, I think, land uh, on the city clerk's team um, as the primary support to council in, in your role as elected officials. So we would need to do some work to sculpt this. And, and obviously, you know, there's a, there's a time parameter here um, that we would be working to, and that may dictate kind of how much of this we can do or, or, or to what extent, um, you know, how in depth we could go. But at, at this point, we could certainly do an assessment of the motion for sure, and to be able to provide council with some response within the timeline. Um, the level of detail, like I say, we, we will have to do some more work on that. Um, okay, uh, that's helpful, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Weeb, up to five. Yeah, I was happy to second this motion. Um, I think it's a great initiative brought forward by Councillor Dominato. Um, I used to work for the Board Resourcing Development Office of the Provincial Government, and I think in my work in creating the best practice guidelines for public board governance, this type of work is critical for the effectiveness of boards. And I think that 
the way this is set up um, can only enhance future boards and leaves a legacy from this council to ensure that every board following us has the ability to be their best. And so I'm very supportive. Thanks very much. I don't see anybody else in the queue, so we'll uh, call a vote on this. Councillor Hardwick. Uh, council that has passed with none in opposition. Thank you so much, Council. So that's it for uh, members' motions. Next, we have notice of Council members' motions. And um, just one second. Okay. Um, so this is notices of Council member motions for upcoming Council meetings. Please remind a reminder to state the title of the motion, the date of council meeting, which you intend to move the motion. And just a, a, re, a reminder that the notice members motions must be sent to the city clerk in writing and include the full title and date of the meeting. Uh, Councillor Kirby. Young. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I have one notice of motion I'm submitting for the April 27th council session, I'm submitting it on behalf of myself and jointly with Councillor Weed. And the motion is entitled Affirming Support for a Formula E World Championship Event, including a conference focusing on climate change and sustainability, musical and cultural event, and the Canadian round of an electric vehicle race. Thanks so much. Uh, we have Councillor Fry next. <clears throat> Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I'm submitting a, a motion uh, for April 27th, incorporating a bike safety index into act urban and active transportation planning. Thanks so much. Uh, I have a motion that I'm bringing forward uh, and that is, um, oh, sorry. I'm gonna take myself off the list because I, I just put myself on at the bottom. Councillor Weeb, you go ahead and then uh, I just have to find my title. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Weeb. Yeah, I have a motion that I'll be bringing, um, which I have called notice multiple times, called Accessible Voting Options for Municipal Elections, and this will be for the Tuesday, April 27th meeting. Okay, great. And I am just looking for my title. Right. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that, Council. So I'm bringing forward notice of motion, limiting uh, 2022 property tax rate increases to no more than 5%. And that would be um, brought forward for the April 27th meeting. Okay, I don't see anybody else on the queue. And uh, so we're gonna move to new business. Councillor Carr. Yes, hello, um, uh, Mayor. I, I'm uh, submitting a motion as urgent business under new business um, okay. for this meeting, and I have circulated it to um, Council. Just want to make sure that um, everybody's got it. You can tell me when I should introduce it. Yeah. I'm just waiting here. Um... Okay, so it's up on screen now. Councillor Carr? Yes, good, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm submitting this because we are in a situation, obviously, of a third wave that's now being um, declared and uh, of, the, of the COVID-19 pandemic um, uh, with the variants uh, being a key feature of this particular uh, wave. Um, of, the ap of the epidemic and um, uh, uh, causing great concern um, in terms of the um, greater contagion that they, um, that they uh, produce. Um, and we are, uh, as a city, um, reliant upon um, so many people to keep our lives going, and amongst those are our first responders. Um, uh, yet our first responders have not been um, prioritized for immunization. Um, other jurisdictions have prioritized first responders. Um, first responders um, have also been noted um, in the federal um, call national recommendations um, as, a, as a needing prioritization. Yet, as I say, in the city, they have not been um, prioritized. 
Um, so uh, this is to send an urgent message um, from mayor and council um, to, um, to those who are uh, in a position to be able to make decisions, um, uh, uh, the form of a letter to the premier, the BC Minister of Health, to all Vancouver MLAs, and, uh, and that would convey our urgent request um, that uh, the appropriate, that they ensure the appropriate decision makers prioritize um, our first responders, Vancouver Fire and Police uh, for COVID immunization, and in particular, ensure vaccination for the uh, Vancouver firefighters and police who work in the downtown east side, um, where the fire hall there, fire hall two has now got 12 staff um, in isolation. Uh, uh, through a uh, risk of exposure. So um, this is a, this is indeed a very urgent situation. I cannot imagine um, what would happen if there were um, the need to even close fire halls. And we did have a fire. Um, this, uh, you know, I think we just need to convey that very clearly. Um, I'm saying that the letter should go to um, uh, those uh, political leaders who can make decisions um, and uh, also they'll be CC'd um, to Dr. Penny Ballum, whom we are familiar with. Um, she's now the ex executive lead for the provincial rollout of COVID-19 vaccinations and also our chief medical officer of Vancouver Coastal Health, Dr. Patricia Daly, and also have our communications department release a letter to, to local media. Um, this would be a letter written by you, Mayor, on behalf of, um, of all of council. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, do we have a seconder for this? I'm happy to second, Mayor. Councillor Bly. Thank you, Councillor Bly. Does anybody wish to speak to this uh, motion? Councillor Boyle? Um, just to say, um, very happy to support this. It's a critical issue, as Councillor Carr outlined so well. I, I don't need to repeat her words, um, but uh, I know uh, I, in particular, have been hearing um, from our firefighters working so hard in many cases, especially at Hull 2, um, in very uh, critical and, and close proximity to folks. And um, I know many other workers across the downtown east side uh, have been able to be vaccinated. And so appreciate all of the effort in this motion, also in the advocacy I know you've been doing, Mayor, um, and the work that Union leadership has been doing, and our new fire chief as well, all pushing um, in the direction to protect uh, these uh, frontline workers who can't work at home like many of us are able to. So happy to support this and appreciate all of that effort. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kirby. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. I think it's context is important here um, because this is a, a very real concern, and I know that there's a lot of groups that um, are frontline workers and there have been a lot of hot breaks and, out, and outbreaks and I appreciate the work of the PHO in trying to identify um, the most vulnerable in the hot spots and I also appreciate the approach that the unions have taken to sort of quiet advocacy um, directly behind the scenes as opposed to um, sort of raising noise about this and I think really that speaks to the fact that they were also supporting um, vulnerable other folks to get that despite the fact that a lot of these workers themselves are in harm's way. I think it's worth noting that on March 18th, the provincial government did announce that essential frontline workers would be prioritized for vaccines and specifically AstraZeneca that was scheduled to start in April. On March 29th, the provincial government suspended the use of AstraZeneca, as we all know, for people under the age of 55. And as a result, the frontline party worker vaccination program was put on hold. Um, at this point, the provincial government has not approved Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for use with frontline party worker program um, at this time. Um, they did announce the possibility of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine being used for the frontline priority worker program at the end of April, although we now know that um, use of Johnson & Johnson in the U.S., for example, has been suspended due to potential related health concerns. So I think while they were identified um, front first responders um, on the priority groups, the challenge has been not that they were prioritized, but the, there was no vaccine supply made available um, based on the sort of a number of challenges in terms of um, what was available and also the issues with AstraZeneca. And so um, I am confident that it's coming and I am confident that a lot of attention has been given to this issue, um, especially over the past few days and uh, in the past week. Um, so I think it's coming, but I think obviously as um, things tick along and workers are down, we haven't heard the stories of how many workers behind the scenes at the FRS and VPD have been down with COVID and they have had it. Um, and if, for example, they had um, qualified under 
the approach the province has taken with hotspots um, in terms of workplace outbreaks. If they were another workplace, um, based on what I'm hearing in terms of the outbreaks they've had, they would have been shut down um, under these new COVID rules, um, where the province is saying if you have three or more workers, you may have a workplace shut down for 10 days, except that they can't shut down because they're essential service. So if you have an attack in progress, um, I think we need somebody to respond. If there is a fire in a burning building, I think we need someone to respond. If they're responding to an overdose call in the downtown east side, obviously they need to respond and they are particularly vulnerable. So um, I am happy to support it, but I'm also quite confident that I think the noise is, is getting louder. And I think that the general public was actually quite surprised um, to hear that um, the workers had not been prioritized or hadn't actually received the vaccines. And I think that's the key semantic difference here is um, they, ha they have not received supplies um, of, of vaccination. So they, they've been in a, a holding pattern and um, they will continue to be um, pending an announcement this week. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kirby Young. We have Councillor Bly next. Thanks very much, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to support um, this motion and uh, appreciate uh, all of the comments so far by my colleagues. Again, I won't repeat them um, or belabor the point, but I think what we recognize is that um, this has been a, a um, our frontline worker or our, our first responders, sorry, have been um, um, responding to many crises across the city, um, COVID being one of them. And um, as uh, Councillor Kirby Young pointed out, has sort of um, I'd say since about December or January when vaccinations became um, available uh, or the program became um, sort of uh, talked about more and, and some of those details came to light, um, there's just been a, a lot of patients uh, waiting for um, what that rollout will look like um, from Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services as well as the VPD. And so acknowledging um, that approach just to um, recognize that they're part of an ecosystem in our city where there are many people that are, are needing to show up to work every single day. I, I think it's important to comment here. Of course, our teachers as well with schools being open are also um, required to um, to show up. And there is some criticism, of course, in the media around some of the different ways in which rollout could or should have happened. And I think at the end of the day, it's just important that um, we as a council um, um, express our support for um, um, these two groups in particular, uh, while recognizing that there's many groups um, that are needing to to be um, in their roles and their professional roles and sort of mandated by the province um, to continue that work. And again, I'll say teachers are, are, are a massive contingent of that group. So um, happy to support and uh, hope to see a response from the province um, to this motion. And, and again, thank you to the mayor for working on this over the weekend and um, to also our fire chief, Karen Fry, for, for her um, um, getting out into the media this weekend to really bring some um, education and spotlight to this issue. Thank you. Thanks so much, Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Carr, for bringing this forward. Um, like my colleagues, uh, I'm very supportive of this. Um, uh, I, I think uh, the risk of being repetitive is that I think we all appreciate um, uh, the critical role our first responders play in the city and that they are a critical and core service. And uh, there has been great advocacy on the part of our mayor and uh, unions and as was noted, uh, head of fire and others um, uh, around this issue. And, and we've had um, uh, clusters of, in, of, um, of uh, cases and so this is incredibly important from my perspective uh, because our first responders are on the front lines dealing with people face to face and uh, I think this is responsive I, I appreciate there's um, a, a, a number of discussions taking place and staff have been uh, working actively uh, and engaging actively with uh, Vancouver Coastal Health on this issue uh, but happy to support uh, this motion this morning. Thanks so much Councilor Kerr. Yeah, just to close, thanks, Mayor. Um, very much appreciate the words um, of all of you, fellow councillors. Um, and, and to note that, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I understand too that um, that the uh, first responders have been involved in quiet diplomacy on this. Um, but this is a, an opportunity that I don't, I, I fear we, sh we would regret if we were to miss it um, as a council to be on the public record um, and to voice our concern um, and desire to see uh, first responders 
provided um, on an urgent basis with vaccinations for COVID given the risks that they face. And um, if we don't do that today, we don't have the opportunity for another two weeks uh, to do such a motion. And I just think that, I mean, I was hopeful I wouldn't have had to put this motion in, that something would have happened today, but it didn't. Um, instead, there was a news re, you know, report saying that the province still is holding to, um, to the position it's had before and so not changing um, uh, yet but I'm hopeful that this will actually be motivating. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, especially if it, it is, is a unanimous decision. Um, so again, thanks for the words of everyone and uh, the concern I know you all feel for um, our first responders, but also people in general around this, uh, this pandemic, which uh, really is taking its toll. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, that's it for speakers. So we'll call a vote on this uh, motion. Councillor Boyle. Uh, Council, that's unanimous. So thanks for that. And thank you, Councillor Carr, for bringing that forward. Um, moving over back to the question queue, uh, Councillor Carr, did you have anything else on new business? I'm fine. Okay. I have an item under new business, which is a request for a leave of absence for uh, Wednesday, April 14th from 9.30 to 11.15 a.m. for civic business, and then another LOA on uh, Thursday, April 15th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. for civic business. Um, could I get someone to move and second that? So moved. So moved. Right. Second. Thank you, uh, Councilor Carr. Uh, all in uh, favor say yay. 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 Opposed nay. Great, thank you so much, Council. Councillor Wave, you're next up on the new business queue. Yeah, two new business. One is the just to acknowledge that the Punjabi market has musqueam banners for the first time in 50 years raised in the community to help honor the past, celebrate the present, and give hope so, uh, to the future. Councillor Wave, this would probably be um, this would probably be other matters. Uh, so new business is just like we've just done with uh, Councillor Carr and any motions or um, leave of absences. Uh, so that would be. Uh, can we just shift you to the next uh, part of the agenda? And okay, great. Councillor Dominato, did you have anything under new business? Uh, yes, Mayor, I have two items. Uh, moving a, a leave of absence uh, for medical reasons or for uh, on behalf of Councillor Di Genova for this morning, uh, 9 30 to noon. And uh, so I guess we'll deal with that one first. Okay, do we have a seconder for that? Second. Right. All in favor say yay. 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 Opposed nay. Okay, thanks. And okay. the uh, second item is a leave of absence for myself for Wednesday, April 14th, uh, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. for civic business. Okay, uh, seconder? Fry. Thanks, all in favor, yay. Yay. Opposed, nay. Okay, that's passed, thank you very much. Anything else, Councillor Dominato, under new business? No, thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Fry. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, moving a leave of absence for myself for Tuesday, May 18th from 10.30 to 12.30 and from 3 to 4.30 uh, for civic business. Uh, okay, we have a seconder. Second, Kirby Young. Thanks, all in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Great, thanks, Councillor Fry. Anything else? Nope, that's it, thanks. Okay, Councillor Hardwick, new business. I guess mine falls under other matters. Okay, uh, so I'm going to, uh, if you don't have uh, any new business, I don't have anybody else in the queue for new business. So now I'll call the next agenda item, which is inquiries and other matters. And I know it's a little confusing because we used to bundle these, but uh, now they're separate. So inquiries, those are questions, for example, the city manager and other matters are announcements like uh, Councillor Fra uh, Weeb was just making. So, uh, okay, so uh, Councillor Weeb. And anybody else wants to put on your queue, uh, go ahead. Councillor Lee. Yeah, I have two other matters. The first one is to recognize Punjabi market has musqueam banners for the first time in 50 years, raised in the community to help honor the past, celebrate the present, give hope to the future. The artist work shown is Pugari Pattern and Peacock by Jagnagra, alongside musqueam woven blanket patterns by Deborah Sparrow and a program called We Walk Together on This Land. Um, the second is Hubbub 16, is on right now, this time it's online, and there's some really amazing projects that uh, council and the public should check out. Um, you can check them out at HTTPS 
at citystudiovancouver.com hubbub16 and there's some great civic projects including um, some naturalized spaces in Northway and Mount Pleasant and online voting is open. That's great. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kirby on. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mayor. I just wanted to extend a very happy um, wishes for very happy Vasaki um, and happy Khalsa Day to everybody that's celebrating. It's also the first day of Ramadan. Um, and it's uh, as we have kind of looped uh, the solar once for COVID, this will be the second time that we won't be able to gather for the parade. Um, in the Punjabi market and along Main Street and um, celebrate uh, together and enjoy snacks and festivities. So I know the community is missing that, but um, it is a very um, sort of festive and joyous time. And so I want to send out um, a lot of joy and light to everybody that's celebrating today. And hopefully um, we will be back um, together for Vasaki next year in 2022. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Hardwick. Yes, thank you. I would like to acknowledge the passing of Vancouver theater legend, uh, former uh, UBC prof Norman Young. Uh, Norman Young died Friday from a heart attack. He was 94 years old and lived every minute of those years. He was a staple of the local theater community, a retired University of British Columbia theater professor who once was the chairman of the Vancouver Civic Theaters and uh, co-founder of the BC Entertainment Hall of Fame. He was also a walking encyclopedia. Uh, so uh, for his service to the city, uh, to the theater community, uh, I just wanted to uh, again acknowledge him and uh, uh, give condolences to his family and the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hardwick. I don't see anybody else on the uh... Q for inquiries and other matters. So we could have a motion to adjourn, Councillor Hart. Motion Harvard. to adjourn. Thank you. Uh, second? Second, second. Councillor Weedon. Great. And uh, all in favor, yay. 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 Opposed, nay. Thanks very much, Council. So that's it for this Council meeting. We do have uh, an in-camera meeting uh, today from 1 till 4. Uh, and then after we finish that, we have our public hearing from 6 onwards. So. Uh, that's it for today. So enjoy the sunshine and we'll see you in camera at 1 p.m. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone. Okay. Bye-bye.